Welcome everyone to Buddha's Center. My name is Jeff Allen and today once again we're discussing Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment. So it's a wonderful day because that's what we're doing and any day that we're doing that uh, is a good day because uh, if we're learning about how to become Buddhist then that will be what will help cause us to become Buddhist. So if we want to have you know a freedom from all of the fears and all of the sufferings of cyclic existence. Uh, and we want to have as much happiness as we can get, right? Uh, then it's going to take becoming a Buddha to have those two qualities, uh, to be completely free from every suffering and to get as much happiness as there is out there to get. As much happiness as a being can have um, the only one who has that much happiness is a Buddha. So here we are today uh, studying a text that in an unerring way, uh, without leaving anything out, that shows us how exactly uh, to become a Buddha. Um, and we're in the very interesting section uh, that I love of this text uh, that I feel like I only really discovered the potency of I don't know, four or five years ago, um, you know, and I've been looking at this text for many more years than that. Um, and this section on meditation that just comes up, you know, out of nowhere after the first topic uh, in the Lam Rim. Um, and it shows us then how to meditate on the rest of the topics, kind of how we then, it shows us how to get started. Um, so it's a, a, a great, great section for any beginner, intermediate, or advanced student uh, to kind of see, you know, how, uh, you know, we've been applying the long rim, if it's been correct, you know, and if we are doing it in a way that's going to transform us. So um, that's what we're doing today. We're going to look at that section uh, a little bit more and, um, you know, maybe go into a little more of the looser details of it today uh, and the general idea, and then maybe get more into the specific uh, topics um, next week. Um, so I encourage everyone between sessions, of course, to just continuously read this text. You know, you get done with the third volume, just start over. And you'll find out that the third volume's understanding just complemented the first volume. So you'll be a little bit You'll have a little bit more wise, you'll have a little bit more ability to focus your mind because you've learned some techniques. And now you can look at the first volume again uh, uh, and, and see it through different eyes, see it through more mature eyes. Um, you know, uh, spiritual maturity happens, you know, through learning and through understanding and then taking that learning and understanding and applying it to some of the earlier things to make sure you learned and understood them correctly. Um, and then just enhancing and enhancing uh, um, our beings um, that will ultimately become Buddhas, uh, um, just enhancing that state, taking that, that gold that's so muddy and dirty within us uh, and cleaning it a little more and a little more and a little more uh, until that Buddha nature that's the gold inside of us, right, uh, shines as bright as it possibly can. Um, because the full maturity has allowed uh, that to happen. Um, so, uh, yes, um, very, very uh, wonderful that we are partaking in that process today. So, um, uh, without getting too distracted um, before the preliminary prayers, let's set a motivation. Let's get into a physical posture uh, that will allow uh, for us to have a clarity of mind. Um, that will, uh, you know, uh, allow for us to proceed with practice and tell uh, ourselves that, yes, we're getting into this physical posture for the sake of becoming a Buddha, uh, for the sake of all sentient beings. Uh, so we get into what's called the seven-point Vairakana posture. Uh, so we start with our legs, uh, preferably in lotus position, uh, but if not in uh, lotus position, then half lotus, or just cross-legged, or feet on the floor. Whatever we can do, uh, um, whatever we can do with our uh, own uh, physical abilities. There's nothing wrong with it. When? Um, when? Where? Oh, I don't know. What do you want to eat? I'm sorry to interrupt. Hey, 
Um, could you, everybody just make sure that they're muted? Uh -oh, okay. Could everybody just make sure they're muted? Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, no, no problem, right? Uh, so we think about the seven point Virakana posture. We get into a very intentional uh, physical position that according to the Lamrim, according to the Indian tradition will allow our mind to have more clarity if we're in a very straight, rigid uh, kind of position. Uh, in terms of our, our back. Um, so we start with our legs in the uh, um, lotus posture, half lotus, cross-legged or on the floor, whatever we can physically do. Um, we shouldn't you know, try to exceed our physical limitations um, uh, if we have some kind of illness that prevents us uh, from being able to get into a full posture. But if it's something that's just a lack of flexibility, then that's something we can work on but we should work on getting into the Vajra posture. I think this is so important. If we are interested in getting into this Vajra posture, don't just try to put your legs into this Vajra posture. When you look at yoga, how they get into this Padma posture, into this Lotus posture, there are very specific steps that you do as a warm up, and the way that you get into that Lotus posture. If you just start trying to yank your legs around, and put it into that posture, um, you're probably gonna hurt yourself and you won't be able to get it into the exact right placement um, because there's certain, uh, the way you would think that it works in terms of you're trying to like bend your knee, it's more at the hip. It's very different when you look at how yoga teaches how to do the Vajra posture. And I encourage folks who are very interested in doing this, who could, uh, to please uh, seek some training on getting into this position um, because getting out of the position also you need training on uh, so that you don't hurt yourself. So you can just stand right up. Um, and if you're doing it properly and you stretch properly, it actually is easier to sit in that position um, for longer periods of time. Um, I've not reached that place, but um, I'm convinced of it at this point now um, because I've uh, I'm just convinced of it at this point. Um, so it's something I'm shooting for. Uh, I don't know if I can get there. I have back issues and some things, but I'm shooting for. Um, and, and it also makes it so your feet don't go to sleep. You're not sitting on your feet or your ankles. You're not cutting off circulation. Um, and it actually is, a, once it's in the proper positioning, it's, it's actually a quite comfortable position. You could see how it could be uh, if you were stretched enough. Um, so um, I don't think that's ever talked about. People say, just get in the Vajra posture, right? And if you can't, don't. But then there's people saying, well, I'm gonna try. Uh, and if you don't have a little bit of training, um, I'm speaking from experience. Um, and uh, um, I had been trying for a very long time. And then I watched a video, it doesn't matter what video, you know, I'm not promoting videos. I watched a video from a, a guru on how to do it. And then I watched another one from another reputable source to see if they were the same. And both work on how to get into this uh, Vajra posture. Um, and they both had specific warmups that were crucial according to these yogis who sit like this as for a living, <laughs> you know, uh, a very specific way to get into it, warm up, get into it and get out of it. Um, and I've made more progress, I would say in a couple of weeks than all the years of my life um, because just knowing the proper stages of the path, not assuming them, right? not assuming I know something I don't know anything about, right? If someone's telling you to do something and you can't, maybe you should figure out well, why can't I? How, how do you? Um, no one really ever inquires about that. So uh, a, a lot of us, by the time we get to the Dharma, um, really are broken <laughs> a little bit physically and, you know, uh, or by the time we become interested enough to want to sit like this, if we've been in the Dharma, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 years, and we start to get interested in sitting like this, you know, our kind of time, our youth has swept away. So, you know, uh, 
I'm just encouraging anyone who you know may be able to do this uh, to try to get into this Vajra posture because it really uh, will increase clarity of mind and, and improve your ability to meditate if it's something you can get into. But if it's something you can't get into because of a physical true illness or limitation, the text says that your mind won't be unclear not sitting in that position. So it's very interesting. It has something to do with like your internal motivation. So uh, we'll leave that part at that. But I wanted to say those things because I think it's important because anyone could see this video right on YouTube and, uh, and say, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to get right into the, I'm doing the best. <laughs> Jeff says the best is the Vajra posture. So, you know, looks at a picture of a Tara and says, okay, I'm just going to put my pretzel, my legs like that and just starts yanking their legs around. Uh, you could hurt yourself. So get proper instruction if you're going to do something that's that uh, So, so yes. Yeah, so the legs uh, in that posture that you can get into, uh, and your hands right on left in your lap with your arms a little bowed out, um, sitting in your lap comfortably. Back straight like a stack of coins. Shoulders in a comfortable position. Uh, you know, not forward, not backward, just in a comfortable position that allows your hands to sit on your lap freely. And that's another point. If you get into that lotus posture, you'll find something very interesting happens that you then have because the feet go in a certain way together. Uh, it's hard to explain that your hands just sit in that little cup that your feet make. Uh, very, very interesting. They, they, it doesn't become like, oh, where should I put them any longer? There's like a little cup. It's very clear uh, where they go. Uh, so just another point uh, of interest. Um, so you have your legs, your hand, your back straight, your shoulders in a comfortable position, uh, your head uh, slightly forward, uh, your eyes slightly open, 45 degree angle, pointed at the tip of your nose, just pointed at, you know, because it's got a point somewhere, pointed at here, uh, but eventually, uh, you know, hoping that all of the physical sense consciousness shut off and that only the mental consciousness is engaging in uh, what we're doing. Because meditation, what we're doing is we're engaging the mental consciousness, trying to transform the mental consciousness, mature the mental consciousness, uh, get the ignorance out of the mental consciousness, um, because that's what moves forward from lifetime to lifetime. Uh, um, and that's what we need to uh, identify uh, and then start to drive instead of having it drive us. Uh, so we have our eyes slightly open, focused on our nose, uh, and then we have our mouth in a comfortable position with our tongue uh, behind the teeth uh, and make your mouth comfortable, you know, uh, have your mouth, uh, tongue at the top of the roof behind the teeth because that allows for circulation of the water, your uh, mouth won't full, fill up with water, but then also you're breathing through your nose. It actually allows for your mouth to not dry out. A kind of circulation of water takes place with it in that position with the coupling it with just breathing through the nose. So you have your legs, your hands, your back, your shoulders, your head, your eyes, uh, um, and your mouth in that position. Uh, now the eighth, which we will focus on, uh, sometimes they say the eighth point of the seven point Virakana posture uh, is the breath. So let's focus on the breath. Let's try to get our mind into a more realistic state that's free from attachment, that's free from a virgin, aversion, uh, that's free from all of the kind of distraction, all of the excitement and uh, sleepiness uh, that we're trying to fight off. Uh, so let's uh, try to get to a place where we can grow virtue from that isn't distracted. Uh, that can solely focus on the virtue that we're talking about uh, and thinking about. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, uh, let's begin to focus on the breath, uh, breathing in and out. Now we add a little bit to the visualization. We're gonna now imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni is in front of us, glowing and radiant in whatever uh, form we see him in. Or if we have other deities or other objects of observation for our meditation, we usually use for our single point of concentration. We can imagine those. So 
So whoever he or she is, we imagine vibrant and glowing. Like a diamond, crystal clear, radiant. Not an ordinary body, a body of light. A body that's transcended all of the organs and blood and bones. A pure, pure being. So we're imagining him or her in the space in front of us while we're focusing on the breath. So we're focusing on the breath, breathing in and out. And we can add the counting if we're able to do so as we exhale one, exhale two, and visualize Buddha Shakyamuni in the space in front of us, glowing and radiant. The real being in front of us. Hold that focus. Begin to think about suffering. The Buddha stated that this is the superior truth of suffering. What did the Buddha mean? I suspect many people came to Buddhism because of what the Buddha meant. We have to experience the suffering of suffering Headaches, losing people we love, getting major illnesses, losing jobs, losing friends. We think about all the things that we find and chase after and think our happiness in this life. And we see that all of those things that we've chased after, that we thought would bring us happiness, for some reason or another, have some sort of self-destruct mechanism of happiness built within them. That brand new car that I thought would bring me so much happiness now is the old car that's broken, that I don't know what to do with, that I'm embarrassed of. The house that I bought to get out of a studio apartment that I saw, thought was so wonderful now suddenly isn't big enough. And now it's making me suffer. Friends that I invested so much time and energy in couldn't imagine getting off the phone with them. Suddenly, I don't even know where they are or who they are because of some misunderstanding. I was separated from that thing I found so dear at one point in time. And I even sometimes consider that person as a bad person now when they were such a form of happiness for me. I see that all of these things within samsara, all of these forms of happiness are like bait I'm like an animal that goes into a have a heart trap to go get that little morsel of food. And then the door shuts behind me again and again and again and again and again. It's that grasping, that attachment that will at the end of my life cause me to be reborn again. and caused me to be closed into a prison, which is a set of aggregates that I didn't choose, which experienced things that I don't want. The Buddha stated that that happiness that's like bait that turns into suffering is called the suffering of change. And that the fact that I would have to be thrown into that circumstance again and again and again and again was the pervasive compounded suffering that every being in cyclic existence would have to endure that. I will always have to endure that if I don't stop it. 
his suffering is the kind of thing that will occur again and again and again if the causes are present. There isn't something that puts a stop to that perpetual cycle. It will just continue over and over and over again. And the Buddha stated that what makes that happen over and over again, that thing that causes us so much pain is called ignorance. It's an ignorance that sees the I as being truly established. And that in dependence upon that, we thought wrong. We had inappropriate mental conduct. And in dependence upon that, we created afflictions. And in dependence upon that, we have contaminated karma or contaminated actions. And in dependence upon that, we suffer. The Buddha stated very clearly that this is what was go what's going on with us. And then the Buddha gave us good news. He gave us something to smile about and said, uh, this is how you have been interacting with your worlds since beginning this time through this veil of ignorance. But these experiences can be stopped. The truth of suffering can end. And the Buddha stated, the way that the truth of suffering can end is by combating the ignorance which creates it. And the Buddha stated that the way to combat that ignorance was by engaging in a path that was realized by holy beings, by superior beings who directly understood how to get rid of ignorance. So we should feel very happy and feel very blessed that we have a way out of these things that we don't want. Uh, those, those things that are so unpleasant that uh, we felt it necessary uh, to go uh, to a class on Buddhism and spend you know, time that we could just be resting, or engaging in some sort of leisurely activity to figure out uh, how to get rid of it. So we've we found out how to get rid of it. Um, so we start to feel happy about that and feel so blessed that we can get out of suffering um, and that we have a very, very clear way, if we want it, to get out of suffering. Then we start to think about other beings. We think about our friends, think about those who are so dear to us. We think about those beings who are neutral to us. We think of those beings that we consider enemies, but when we start to try to establish who is an enemy or what is an enemy, uh, we have a little bit of a difficulty. We say, are they my enemy or my, my kindest friend? Because in previous lives, all sentient beings have been so kind to us. In our most vulnerable state, they've shown us the most, the highest amount of kindness a being could, the highest amount of altruism a being could. They put their, their needs on the side and they took care of us. They previously did this for us. And unfortunately, right now, they're almost like a, it says in the text, like a madman under the control of karma and afflictions. And our, our kind, kind, kind mother is, is almost possessed. Uh, she's fallen, uh, or he, father, uh, into this precipice. Uh, and you're standing there and, and can help. So we need to think of it uh, in this way, in these very, very clear ways. When we were in the most vulnerable state, we were helped by them. Now they're in the most vulnerable state. They're under the control of their, their afflictions. They're doing things that uh, are gonna cause them to suffer in the future. And we, we see it uh, and we call them an enemy because we don't like the sounds that we're hearing coming out of their mouth. But we created the causes to hear those sounds. 
and they were so kind to us uh, and they're out of control right now. They've fallen, they've fallen again uh, into the pit of samsara, into the thing that will cause them more samsara. So we start to try to understand it, how nice it would be if my friends, those who are neutral to me, uh, those people I consider my enemies who now I realize were just uh, named that right now uh, and they're were so kind to me before, how nice it would be if my friends, enemies and neutrals uh, and all other beings that you know, maybe I can't even think about or may fall into those categories, uh, um, how nice it would be if they had happiness and the causes of happiness, may they have it, may I cause them to have it, how nice it would be if they were free from suffering and the causes of suffering, uh, may they have it, may I cause them to have it. We start to think about how nice it would be if they were in this state of happiness, free from suffering. Because you, now you've been able to imagine that state for yourself. You had joy when you found out that you could be free from suffering and have eternal happiness, have the most happiness that's possible. Uh, now uh, you, you have the same joy uh, that says that you want uh, you know, that now, oh, you have a solution uh, for sentient beings. There's a joy there. They can be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Uh, and you say, I'll do it. I'll take it on myself. Uh, and you recognize that you don't have the capacity. Even though you have this joy and this desire to do it, uh, you don't have the capacity uh, to free them from suffering. You have a joy that recognizes you can be free from suffering. You have a joy that recognizes they can be free from suffering. You have a joyous attitude that wants to free them from suffering, but you're limited. Uh, you don't have the qualifications to be able to do it. Um, and thus far, uh, you've learned one thing, and that is the only reliable guide is the Buddha. Um, so if your aim uh, is to joyously um, help sentient beings have happiness and be free from suffering, uh, and to be able to be the most capable person to do that, uh, then one must become a Buddha. And we know that in order to become a Buddha, we have to have the wisdom arisen from hearing, contemplation, and meditation. Um, so it's for that reason that we're here today at this class on Buddhism. Uh, that we're going to recite prayers and we're going to analyze the meaning of the prayers and analyze the meaning of the teaching being given. Uh, uh, in order to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, because the Buddha is the only reliable guide. Uh, the only way we can achieve our goals is by becoming a Buddha, um, because the only way to get rid of the afflictive obstructions and the cognitive obscurations or the obstructions to our omniscience is by becoming a fully enlightened Buddha. Uh, and the only way that we can fulfill all sentient beings' needs is to become a Buddha. Um, because if we are not omniscient, we don't know which each individual sentient being needs for the various varieties of personalities and predispositions and so forth. We don't know where they are on the path or what kind of imprints they have from their previous lives that could be activated. Uh, so we're handicapped. We're not able to fully help them. So uh, here we are today to learn how to fully help them, to learn how to reach that state of, of complete reliability. Um, so it's for that reason that we then begin uh, with the visualization where we visualize all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and our root gurus uh, in the merit field uh, in front of us. Um, we imagine it in whatever way that we can. Um, there, you can imagine the merit field in the grandest way with all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and hearers, solitary realizers, and so forth. Uh, you know, all the four classes of Tantra, if you're very advanced, you can get all the 35 Buddhas, I mean, into one visualization. Um, and then there's the visualization called all in one, where you imagine all of those beings in one being. Um, and then maybe you start to build from there and start to put more beings into the picture. Depends on your abilities, right, uh, for visualization and meditation. Um, but just imagine what you can, right? All beings in one or all beings or something in between the two in the space in front of you. Kensar Geshe Wandak in the space in front of you. Geshe Lopsang Gompo and His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Geshe Dorje Damdela and Geshe Ma Tenzin Ladran and Geshe Aga, all these great beings, right? Uh, from our time, uh, uh, we imagine uh, these beings and 
Buddha Shakyamuni and Tara, and Vajrayogini, all these great beings uh, in the space in front of us. And they're all so pleased uh, that we're doing something virtuous. So we imagine they're full of joy, they're rejoicing, uh, and they're so, so happy. Uh, and this is good for us because we know that we gain virtue by making others happy. And now we're making the greatest beings in the world happy. So we should feel good about that. And we shouldn't make like this a pretend fairy tale. If we believe the Buddha is omniscient. We believe that the Buddha is always with us. And whenever we summon the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, if they have this ability to emanate, they will come because of omniscience. And if we don't see them, it's because of our karmic obscurations. It's because we don't have the ability to see them, right? Like the story of uh, Maitreya and Asanga, where Asanga couldn't see Maitreya until some karmic obstacle had been removed. Asanga saw Maitreya as a dog. Uh, a sick dog. Uh, and then when the karmic obscurations that were removed from a Sangha, a Sangha realized that sick dog was actually Maitreya the whole time. Uh, and the Maitreya had been uh, with him meditating the whole time. Uh, so it's very similar to that. When we summon the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, they all come. Uh, we just can't necessarily see them. So we have to imagine that that's actually happening. We were visualizing this in our mental consciousness. We're imagining this as a real event that's happening with engaged beings that are alive. They're not paintings. They're actual beings that are alive in front of us uh, that are happy uh, and that uh, wouldn't want us to be doing anything else but practicing Dharma. So that's the front visualization. Then around us, we imagine all sentient beings. We imagine uh, our parents, our uh, friends, our brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, all those sentient beings uh, we, we consider as friends, our neutrals, our people we consider enemies, you know, we, we, we kind of transform out of that state, but they're people we know who they are, and we know that we consider them as that kind of negative, in that negative place. We put them uh, in this field around us, uh, and then we put all of the beings that we can imagine in the hell realm, the hungry ghost realm, uh, and the animal realm, and the human realm, and the demigods, and the gods realm. We try to get as much clarity as we can around this visualization. Uh, and we realize that when we say this word neutrals or strangers, we can also think about those beings who were involved in the production of all of the things that we use. And we think about the pen that we use. So those people can also be brought into our meditation as people who are strangers. We know who they are, but we don't know who they are, but we know they existed in order for us to have a computer in front of us, in order for us to have a cushion in front of us, a book in front of us. How many sentient beings were necessary in order for that to take place? So those people become our neutrals because we have a connection with them. We can think of them. We may not think of their exact faces, but we can think of them doing duties. Uh, so we can add that into neutrals. And then when we exhaust all of our mental capabilities around friends, enemies, and neutrals, then we can do and all the other sentient beings, right? Uh, so we imagine them all around us. We imagine that we are leading them uh, in the prayers that we're about to do. Uh, and that we imagine uh, that they're uh, not only reciting the prayers um, in whatever languages of their individual realms or whatever their individual beings' languages are, um, we imagine that they're understanding the meanings of them and contemplating the meanings of them because we're doing the same. So we're imagining that we're replicating our uh, positive thoughts in all sentient beings' minds, if that makes sense. And that's how we're connecting with all sentient beings. We're imagining that we're replicating this thought um, uh, um, uh, about the Heart Sutra, for instance. We're listening to the words of the Heart Sutra or imagining they're listening to the words of the Heart Sutra or meditating on uh, the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, the path of uh, seeing, the path of meditation and path of no more learning that's implicitly in the Heart Sutra. Uh, the, the generation of the mind that aspires to enlightenment uh, that's, that's in there, that first path of accumulation and the union of calm abiding and special insight that has as its object of observation emptiness uh, um, uh, um, at, the, at the path of uh, preparation. And then the direct perception of emptiness brought out about yogic uh, direct perception of emptiness that happens at the path of seeing. Uh, and then the, the, the latter, real, and then the realizations that happen again and again and again from there on uh, to the bodhisattva uh, throughout the pathways to purify the various obscurations um, uh, through the path of meditation to reach that path of Buddhahood of no more learning, knowing that's all contained in the Heart Sutra and, and meditating on that meaning and understanding all that was just said, the path of accumulation and the generation of bodhicitta is empty of inherent existence. The path of preparation and the union of abiding special insight that uses as its object of observation emptiness is 
empty of true establishment. The path of seeing that sees emptiness directly is empty of true establishment. The path of meditation that has reoccurring direct perceptions of emptiness lacks true establishment. The Buddhahood, the path of no more learning, lacks true establishment. So the Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge teaches us all of these pathways and teaches us that all of these pathways lack true establishment because they dependently originate. So we're imagining that all sentient beings are not only reciting and getting the verbal virtue, but they're hearing this, right, and getting the virtue of hearing these teachings. They're meditating on the meaning of these teachings because it's what we're doing. We're hearing it, we're saying it, and we're meditating uh, on the meaning of these teachings. So uh, when we're doing these visualizations of sentient beings around us, or we're imagining uh, in so many, many meditations you see, you imagine beings engaging in the virtue with you, or you are in some way participating with sentient beings. Um, but remember, you're trying to have this familiarization with a thought in your own mind, like they are. So you're familiarizing their minds with your thoughts so that you can eventually help mature them in the most reliable way. Um, uh, so, um, Without further ado, uh, let's get into the Heart Sutra with this visualization. And, and we should really, really think we've been in this bodhicitta class and learning all about bodhicitta and the causes of bodhicitta and so forth. Uh, before we get started with this recitation, uh, let's think about generating the mind of bodhicitta for the sake of all sentient beings, becoming a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings, uh, recognizing that our uh, uh, equanimity and having an equal desire to benefit our friends, enemies, and neutrals. Uh, and then are starting really with the meditation of our neutrals, uh, friends, and enemies uh, for equanimity. Uh, and then meditating that all sentient beings are our mothers, remembering their kindness, wishing to repay their kindness, establishing the first three causes of the six causes for the mind that aspires to enlightenment that help us to get affection. Uh, and then meditating on this, the stages, the next three causes of the seven point cause and effect for realizing bodhicitta that allow us to generate a mind intent on others' welfare. And that is love through the force of attraction, a great compassion, and then the extraordinary attitude of altruism that then causes us to want to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Uh, so let's generate that mind that wishes to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Uh, and then let's recite the prayer uh, thinking about the things that were just mentioned with all the sentient beings around us, thinking about the implicit, explicit meaning, the virtue of hearing, the virtue of reciting, uh, and meditating, and so forth. So, uh, without further ado, the Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagriya at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha monks and a great gathering of the Sangha Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered this body that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination, and at the same time, Noble Abhukateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, while practicing the profound Prajnaparamita, saw in this way. He saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Noble Abhukateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita? Addressed in this way, Noble Abhukateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, a son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita should see in this way, seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Form is empty Emptiness, emptiness also is form. Emptiness is no other than form. Form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity, no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye, dhatu, up to no mind, dhatu, no dhatu of dharmas, no mind, consciousness, dhatu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance, up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable true complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajaparamita, the mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequal mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth since there is no deception. The Prajaparamita mantra is said in this way, Teata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhisoha. 
Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound Prajaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that samadhi and praised Noble Abhukateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, thus it is, O son of noble family, thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Abhukateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Gala jube ne jo damba ne nguje du jo nga i du do jen du ba bo lam a i bo jen zi ne zo nga ndro zo la ja ze lo ga za ma ra te jan da ra za ma ra be ng Agasamara Jashanda Razamara Yamidi Adon Gadi Gadi Baragati Barazangadi Buddhizo Baba Gancha Sanji Gayet in Bidaji Shabadaji Mevadaji Shewadaji Jagi Baji Madamaja Tanji Shedding Gayez Oha Gerin Dunjaji Shewadan Midun Bej and Dandavadan Dumba Dunji and Banzon Sanji Shaji De John and Dade Lejo. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love, and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. <laughs> Send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. Idam Guru Radha Mandala Gamni Radha Yami Nanye Janan Jaye Janan La Janju Badu Danye Jazuji Dagi Jiji Jive Zananji Jala Benji Zanye Jubajo Zanye Jadan Jaye Janan La Janju Badu Danye Jazuji Dagi ji 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 be zanan ji jo la ben ji e ju ba jo zan ji jo dan zo ji jo na la jan ju ba du dan ye ja zu ji dagi ji 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 be zanan ji jo la ben ji zan ji ju ba jo. The one who is transformed into the reliable guide motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher Sugata and protector to you, I make prostration. The one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations and is endowed with the divine bodies of the vast and the profound, who eternally shines forth the forever noble light rays, to you, the Buddha, I make prostrations. I'm inspired by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of full awakening for the benefit of sentient beings. May this teaching be heard and understood in the language of all sentient beings. So now you imagine all sentient beings, right, are listening to the teaching. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are happy, right, that there's a teaching going on, you know, so they're all, you know, rejoicing and happy. So you stand, sustain this meditation. And then if you're teaching, you're imagining you're teaching to all sentient beings. And the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are happy uh, um, because you're doing what they want you to be doing. <laughs> 
you know, as long as you're doing it for the right reason and that you are uh, doing it with, you know, a clean, pure, um, not only motivation, but um, presentation of the Dharma, you know, that it isn't something that's wrong, <laughs> being misrepresented and saying, oh, this is Buddhism, you know, this is what the Buddha taught, uh, and then te teaching some sort of nihilism or something. Um, very easy to misunderstand what the Buddha taught. So last week, we were talking about uh, getting into the nitty gritty, right, of what we actually do to start a practice. What would we, uh, if we wanted to do an actual sitting session, you know, how does Lama Tsongkhapa suggest uh, that we go about doing that? Um, so uh, it first starts uh, with getting into uh, the preparations, the six preparations. Um, so we went over those six preparations, uh, which said first, uh, clean the room, you know, whatever, you know, that means to you, you know, uh, we told stories about Chudapantaka sweeping. Uh, um, I think his name is uh, maybe like Chongo, small road, Arya small road. Anyway, story of him sweeping and be able, being able to develop realizations and cleanse his mind through the process of cleaning. Uh, and also because we're going to invite holy beings uh, in the Lam Rim, it says, uh, it, you know, if you were going to invite the most important person in the world to your house, you'd probably clean it first. Uh, and when you start a practice, you're inviting all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in. Uh, they all show up, uh, even though we can't see them. And it would be nice if out of respect um, and belief that they're all coming, you know, this is all building on faith and building on our respect and you know, uh, and so forth. Like when we look at the beginning of the Lam Rim, we're, you know, um, showing that this, you know, Atisha is great. It's from noble lineage and that the teaching is great. Why? In order for us to get respect, to engender respect for the instruction, um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so this is the reason that we're preparing things in that way. We're thinking of it in that way. We're, uh, we're thinking like we're inviting this holy being into our room. So we're cleaning it. Uh, so the first preparation uh, is, you know, cleaning the room and then putting uh, uh, objects uh, of refuge, you know, Buddhist, um, symbols of Buddha's body, speech, and mind uh, on this altar or table. Um, uh, and then it says uh, to obtain offerings uh, in the proper way and then arrange them beautifully uh, in front of these images of enlightenment. Uh, then uh, it says to get into a sitting posture upright. And then in the commentaries, it talks about the seven point Virakana posture. Um, and it says to kind of get your mind right. <laughs> Lama Sulgaba basically says, get your mind right. You know, make sure it's not, doesn't have any excitement. Make sure your mind's not too busy. Right. Uh, make sure you're you're you know like so sleepy. Asanga in the Lam Rim, I think, says that you know take a walk around. Uh, it, it says in the Lam Rim Chemo, and we'll open it up in the suggestions that uh, take a walk around. You know, uh, if you're feeling sleepy, to kind of reclaim your mind uh, in order to clear it. And Rinpoche always said, uh, "There's other instructions: take some tea, have a coffee, have a nice cold drink." look at the moon, that's supposed to do something. You know, if you look at the moon, I don't know. I've never figured that one. I don't know, I, I've tried it. Um, maybe I was just way too tired when I looked at the moon. Uh, maybe I just needed, maybe if there was just a little dullness and I looked at the moon, maybe the dullness would have cleared. But I remember being really, really sleepy on like a full moon. And I was like, I was testing it, you know. <laughs> and it didn't seem to, you know, completely clear clear away my, uh, but I probably just needed sleep. And it talks about that in the long run too, that you, you have to have appropriate sleep and appropriate diet in order to do any of this. So we'll get to that after that's in the next little part um, of the secret section of the long run. No one talks about. Um, so, so yes. Yeah, so we set this up, we get into this meditative posture that's going to allow for clarity of mind. Uh, and then it says for, we visualize the merit field. Um, uh, we imagine all the gurus, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and just as I talked about in the intro, I'm not going to go into detail. There's so many merit field visualizations, um, and I don't have a specific one passed down that said, this is the one that we're doing <laughs> only. So because I don't have that kind of instruction, I'm not going to give you that kind of instruction. 
Um, so I'm not going to make something up. I've seen a lot of instructions in a lot of commentaries, and they're a little different. So because I haven't been given a specific one to tell, I won't. Um, um, so you do what you can within your mind based on those conditions, and you can you can start you can learn all kinds of merit field visualizations if you start to want to in terms of different lineages uh, and so forth. So. Um, then uh, you want to get the cooperative conditions uh, for the production of the path. So you need accumulation, you need purification, um, and then also you get a little added benefit of increase uh, by doing the next step, which is number five, uh, which is a seven limb prayer. Um, so we make a seven limb prayer. Uh, we went over that in, in a good amount of detail uh, last week. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but I will say uh, you know, so now you've cleaned the room, put the images of enlightenment in front of you, right? Uh, so you now have some solid images of enlightenment in front of you that you're supposed to be imagining as actual Bruce. Um, and then you're, you know, you put the offerings very beautifully in front of them and you get ready, you get into a posture uh, and then you visualize all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, you know, uh, that aren't the ones just on your little throne, you know, not, uh, altar rather that you put together. Um, and then you imagine them uh, all around. Uh, and then the, you imagine that yourself and all sentient beings, right? Just keeping with this theme are now making a, 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 an offering of the seven limbs. So making the offering of, of homage or obeisance, or the body, speech, and mind. Then uh, making offerings, uh, you know, those owned and unowned, those mundane and super mundane offerings, uh, um, making all of those offerings. Uh, you know, you could set them up on the altar, but then you also make, vi you know, visualize all these different offerings uh, uh, being made. And then we confess our negativities um, uh, and acknowledge all the downfalls that we've engaged in, all the misdeeds that we've done that we can remember uh, in this life, all the ones we can't remember in this life, and all the ones we can't remember since beginning this time. Uh, so we say that out loud uh, to keep reinforced in our mind that we don't want to do the wrong thing again in future lives, <laughs> that we have now put a stake in the ground and said those things that we used to do and these things that we're doing, we find distasteful. This is disgusting. I want my mind disgusted with this. It's so disgusted that I've got to come in front of all these beings who are so proud of me and saying, I've, I'm, I've done this, these things. Um, uh, please help me. Please emanate in ways that will help me stop doing these things. And that's what's very interesting. You want to work on patience. Uh, and you tell the Buddha that, don't be surprised if someone very irritating comes in your life, you know? <laughs> and don't be so sure that's not a Buddha emanating to try to help you. Uh, so we, we have to sometimes abandon like ordinary appearances. So we're, we're admitting uh, our misdeeds so that we can then connect. We wanna be helped with these and we wanna stamp in our mind that these things stink. Uh, so then we make a new stamp in our mind called rejoicing. We stamp in our mind that good things are great and that we find good things wonderful. You know, the bad things we've done are terrible and we hate, we, we feel so embarrassed and we regret them. Uh, but the good things that we've done are as plentiful, are very plentiful. Uh, and we're good, we're good beings, right? Uh, we have good qualities. We've done good things. Uh, and we rejoice in all of those good things that we can remember uh, and have forgotten uh, in this life. And then we rejoice in all of the good things that we've forgotten in our previous lives that we've done. We would just rejoice and say, you know, I must have done so many wonderful things to have a human basis. I'm here, you know, in the United States of America. And, you know, you can keep narrowing it down. We're all in a pretty wonderful place in terms of where you could live as a human being. We've, you know, had an education. We've had a lot of, you know, wonderful things that was caused by virtue we previously created. So we have to rejoice in that. We have to give ourselves our mental consciousness, you know, the, the credit for having within it goodness, right? We have goodness and we have things that aren't good. We just need to remove all the things that aren't good. We're gonna hold on to the goodness. That's why we dedicate it and we stamp our minds with goodness. So we hold on to the goodness until it becomes the cause for our Buddhahood. We don't want it to go away. We hold on to the goodness. We get rid of the, the bad stuff. You know, the Buddha said, uh, you know, commit no evil, gather as much virtue as possible and subdue your mind, right? Um, so the Buddha, you know, talked uh, in that way. 
Um, so, you know, that's, we need to gather, we need to admit the wrongs we've done so that we can, you know, abandon non-virtue in the future, rejoice in the good things we've done so that we can keep doing them in the future so that we can gather as much virtue as possible. Uh, and then we have to uh, subdue our minds. And then it says, this is the teaching of the Buddha. Um, and Geshe Dorje Damdu shows how this is renunciation, bodhicitta, and emptiness. You know, uh, he, he says that, you know, we can see that, you know, abandon evil, abandon misdeeds. You know, this is renunciation, the desire to emerge, emerge from wrongdoing. Um, you know, gather as much virtue as possible. How do you do that as a bodhisattva? bodhicitta. It's how you gather the most potent virtue. That's the virtue that makes you a Buddha. That's the happiest you can get. Subdue your mind. How do you subdue your mind? Motivated by renunciation and bodhicitta, you see emptiness. You gather wisdom. Uh, so, you know, this is what we're doing. That's why we're stamping our mind with don't do non-virtue, stamping our mind with do virtue. Um, and then next, we're stamping our mind with wanting to hear Dharma teachings and wanting the Dharma teachings to continue for us. So then we ask, please continue to turn the wheel of the Dharma. So we have this merit field. We have all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. If there are current gurus that are alive, imagine them on thrones, not on lotuses. You don't imagine gurus and, until they've passed on on lotuses only. You imagine them on very firm thrones if they're alive with snow lions supporting them, <laughs> you know, that they're stable and alive and not going anywhere until they pass. And then they go on to a lotus. But in the meantime, any gurus you're imagining in this field, imagine on very stable thrones and they're on that stable throne and you're saying, please turn the wheel of Dharma. Please continue to teach. Uh, so that's the next step where we five. five uh, and, um, and number six, uh, we beg, uh, the, the beings not to just abide in nirvana, to stay in our world, right? Uh, because if, uh, you know, um, if the nirmanakaya, if the emanation body, if we're saying is a Buddha, that would go to the highest level, uh, um, withdraws itself, um, um, then we don't have access to it. I mean, we can pray, to, you know, to being like Rinpoche's self, but the, the Nirmanakaya has been withdrawn. The emanation body is withdrawn. It's not in front of us any longer. Uh, so we're begging beings to remain with us, to not withdraw that, to stay in this world with us. Uh, so we're keeping it stamped in our mind that we, the source of all my good is my kind Lama. Stay in this, teach me and stay. Don't, don't leave me. And it's not for just now, it's for all my lives. At the end of the teaching, I say, may we never be separated from Kensei Geshe Wanda. This is how we continue to do that. We say, stay in this world. The ones who are here, stay in this world. Please stay in this world. You know? um, we have to assume if we believed Rinpoche uh, was a Buddha or Bodhisattva, that he's not only in one place, so he's here. <laughs> you know? So we could say, stay in this world and not be illogical about it. You know? We can use logic to ask him still to stay in this world. Uh, it depends on how you know, much we want to get into that. Um, but we're asking the, them to stay in this world, not to go to an abiding nirvana, not to pass into pure land, away from uh, to a place where we can't see them um, until we can, right? <laughs> until we're Arya Bodhisattvas and we can go to this uh, place where the um, enjoyment body is teaching us in all of its radiant form uh, uh, and we can connect with Rinpoche at that level. But until then, uh, you know, may you abide in this world that I'm in here. Uh, and then you dedicate, which is the seventh limb, uh, um, all of this to becoming a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Dedicate it to being able to understand whatever topic you're about to meditate on. Very interesting. At the head of it, I dedicate it to being able to understand how, um, how to relate to a spiritual friend. So now you've just loaded your next step. You've made a dedication. You've told your mind, oh, may all this virtue through the power of this pure truth, may I come to understand the importance of relying on a teacher, life of leisure and opportunity, death and impermanence, whatever meditation topics we're going to go through. And also, may I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. You can make a 
you could dedicate for the next 24 hours, you know, if you were, you know, really equipped and had enough coffee, maybe, you know, so you're making this dedication and you're really trying to hone in on what you're doing. So it's easy to say for Buddhahood, for the sake of all sentient beings, but if right now I'm studying a specific topic and I'm trying to realize it, that's going to happen in order for me to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. So my dedication shouldn't just be so far-sighted, they should be short-sighted as well so that I connect my mind the next moment to accomplishing those tasks. Um, so it's not saying that we have to draw it out for so long, but always make your practice something that's applicable to where you're at right now. So easy to say, may I become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Um, but if you're in the midst of studying bodhicitta and trying to understand, you know, oh, how is it different that I, you know, I, I, I want to repay their kindness and then I want to give them this, then I want to do that, but then I want to do all of it. What's the difference, you know, uh, between all these different types of thoughts? Um, you know, uh, it, it will allow you uh, um, to have a deeper, richer, I lost my train of thought, I apologize, but I think uh, uh, <laughs> it happens to the best of us uh, and the worst of us. So you've seen it in action. Um, I lost my train of thought, but you're, you're making these dedications in order for you to be able to apply, uh, su have success in your practice so that you can have success ultimately, which is Buddhahood. Um, so um, don't only say, uh, oh, through this, because we're now sitting down to do something specific. This is a meditation session that Lama Tsongkhapa has carved out, right, of the introductory topics to say, this is what you're doing with. Okay, now I taught you about guru devotion, relying on a spiritual friend. Um, and I've taught you also the greatness of teaching, the greatness teacher, the greatness of the teaching, and how to listen to and explain teachings. Now, this is how you would conduct a session about topics. So if we'll start with just relying on the teacher, because that's the first topic, how to lead students to be actual instructions. Uh, so now you have this topic of relying on the teacher. Um, so now you've done this whole practice. Now, Lama Tsongkhapa says that you should have set up before you sit down. What am I specifically trying to accomplish? Okay. Am I going, you know, and in the Lam Rim, it says that we realize these topics, and then realize the next topics. It's not that we don't study all the topics, but the realizations really enrich each other um, in a very, very special way. Um, so, you know, uh, how does, does, does that occur, um, you know, in a, in a way that will allow me um, to have stability to be able to become a Buddha for this, this sake of all sentient beings. So uh, we get to this, this topic of relying on the teacher. So we set up, okay, what am I gonna specifically think about? So we say, okay, I'm gonna do a general Lam Rim meditation. Okay, I'm gonna meditate on the, uh, you know, the, the teaching shared in common with beings of small capacity and just think about, uh, you know, getting out of the lower realms and what the lower realms are, just glancing meditation, it's called. Running meditation, sometimes it's called. Uh, and think about getting out of the lower realms and how you would do that by going for refuge, abandoning the 10 non-virtues, uh, and then acknowledging your downfalls. And you think about the medium scope, they're sharing common with beings and medium capacity. You think about, uh, you know, the lower realms and the higher realms are plagued with suffering. Uh, and you think about the Four Noble Truths uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, and then, then you know, you, you think about, okay, the Four Noble Truths only allow me to get to uh, uh, an abiding nirvana. I won't have the effect. I'll have the afflictive obstructions removed, but not the obstructions to omniscience. So then you meditate on what will allow me to have a complete package of removal of afflictive obstructions and obstructions to omniscience. And you find out that that's practicing the, the, the teachings for beings of great capacity. And you think about, you know, the various things about bodhicitta and the seven point cause and effect uh, and equalizing and exchanging self with others practice. So you don't have, if you were to take each of those topics and thoroughly investigate them, how many hours, right? So that's why it's called glancing meditation. You're not diving in, right? You're just almost make, making sure you've got the outline down in your mind and you're starting, because once you have the outline down, then it becomes very, very natural. And then you can start to plug in your realizations into the outline, if that makes any sense. So you get this kind of general outline down, you do a glancing meditation and then you know who you are and you say, okay, I. I don't have renunciation. So 
I could spend all my time on bodhicitta, right? Um, this is a for instance, right? Um, I don't know really much about suffering enough. I don't even really know if I believe in reincarnation. So trying to meditate on a mind that wants to get all beings out of cyclic existence that requires all of that information isn't really going to be the most logical use of your time. So in the Lam Rim, Lama Tsongkhapa says, and Pabunka Rinpoche says in this really beautiful letter uh, that he wrote uh, um, to a monastery in Kham uh, about how to actually engage in these practices. He says that, you know, you can do this glancing meditation and then you hone back in on the, where you're at. You look in the mirror of the Dharma, you know who you are. You know, do I have this realization? And then if you don't, then this is, you know, where you go, right? So if you say you have three realizations later, uh, you can quickly get to the, that third, you know, uh, three realizations before it, right? You can quickly just speed that up to the fourth and then you need to, you know, and you don't have the fifth onto the millionth, right? Uh, so you have the three down. So you get to the, so you can quickly, uh, you do your glancing meditation over the whole package. Now you have the first three topics down. So you, you have them. There's no huge meditation to do right? You have it. You've realized it. You only know if you've realized it. I don't know if you've realized it. You only know if you've realized relying on a teacher. You only know if you have had this leisure or not, this understood this leisure and opportunity that we have and wake up like blown away that you have another chance of leisure and opportunity. You only know that, right? You only know if you've realized these things. Um, uh, so you would, you know, if you've realized it up to the fourth topic, you know, you get very quickly to that fourth topic and then you're going to hit that place where you got to do some work. Now, your mind has been controlling you and telling you what to do for the most part up till now. Oh, let me go get this. I got to go here. I got to do this. I need to exercise. Oh, my gosh. I feel so, uh, 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 you know, our minds just been, the uh, you know, telling us what to do. And there hasn't been a whole lot of control over our mind we've just kind of had an impulse and then we felt like we were in control because based on that impulse we went and did something but that impulse that you know made us to do this or that we weren't really in that much control of, of um. so here we're trying to tell our mind exactly what to do and when to do it this is where we start to, to learn how to do that. We're not learning the stages of a meditation yet because we're not that far into the Lam Rim. But Lama Tsongkhapa definitely gets into a lot of points that are within it, within those later stages of meditation where you're trying to keep your mind focused on what you're telling it to stay focused on. I'm doing glancing meditation. So that's a specific meditation that I've sat down to do. I'm going to go through all of these stages. So, you know, if when I'm thinking of, oh, you know, I need to definitely emerge from cyclic existence, I need to get this attitude day and night. I really like the Disney character, Donald Duck. You know, Donald Duck was really, when you, <laughs> if your mind starts to do that, you've got to bring it back because your mind started doing what it wanted to. You, you sat down and said, mind, I'm going to follow, I'm doing this. And now your mind took back over. So you lost some vigilance. You lost your mindfulness and conscientiousness. You lost your ability to hold. You forgot the object, right? Uh, and you weren't seeing if you were about to because you weren't being conscientious. You weren't you know, uh, being vigilant about uh, checking it. So somehow or another, uh, you weren't checking to see if the object of observation was slowly <laughs> disappearing. Uh, your mind subtly went into some things, laxity or dullness, uh, uh, laxity, and, uh, laxity or excitement. You weren't paying attention with introspection. You weren't being conscientious. You know, you weren't seeing if it was about to, you know, lose its object. And now it's lost. And, and now you got to rein it back in and have mindfulness say, okay, this is the object that I'm supposed to be meditating on. Where was I again? Oh, the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and wanting to definitely get out of what was I doing, cyclic existence, what was the problem? And then you have to see how far back you need to get to to grab your mind again and tell it what to do. So this is what you do the whole time. So you set out to do a glancing meditation. 
you get through whatever that glancing meditation is, the small scope up to the great scope, to the, you know, you started out with the very smallest scope topic in your mind, you know, really quickly in an outline, uh, as much of the outline as you can in the amount of time that you have. And you end up at the completion stage, you know, of highest yoga tantra, the 10th bodhisattva ground, you know what I mean? And how that would, you know, play out from A to B, you know, from the, the beginning stage of a practitioner looking to spiritually develop to the matured Buddha, you know, you go through that, that there'd be a glancing running meditation. Um, and uh, as I was saying, uh, um, I've seen before where it talked in the, the, the uh, succession guru yoga, where it talks about great beings being able to, you know, in the time it takes to saddle a horse, like put one foot, they put a foot in the stirrup. By the time they get the other foot over the horse, they could meditate on all six sessions. In the Lam Rim, it says that they could, you know, a great Lam Rim master could meditate on the whole path from start to finish in the amount of time that they put their foot into a, what is it, a stirrup? Is that what it's called, maybe? And, and then they kick their leg over the top of it and put it in the other stirrup. And that amount of time, a great practitioner could have meditated on the entire stages of the path to enlightenment from beginning to the final completion stage of highest yoga tantra. Um, so that's a goal, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a great goal. And with clarity and with certainty, not with like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, just not with, with clarity. Um, so we get through that glancing meditation, for instance. This is just a for instance. I'm not telling anyone what to do. Read it in the Lam Rim. Um, but this is how you would do it. It says, be very specific on what you're going to meditate on. Know, know what you're going to meditate on and then sit down and do only that. And then when you start doing something other than that, rein it back in to that. And this is how you start to every day gain control of your mind. You can see how this would help you later tell your mind to focus only on one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. It's a little easier to only focus on movement of the mind and analytical meditation is <laughs> for us thinky people, <laughs> analytical meditation is great. You could get you know drunk on it sometimes, right? Going through it and going through all the channels and you're really focused, but then take that same kind of mind, right? That you've taught to only focus on what you're telling it to uh, and then try to only focus on one thing that becomes, and do it for hours at a time. Only one thing, the same thing, the whole time, the same size, uh, <laughs> that becomes a different task altogether, but it becomes more possible if you have at the beginning told your mind what to do a little bit. Told your mind, no, stop. That's not what I'm meditating on, I'm meditating on this. And that's what you do. You go through your glancing meditation, you tell your mind what to do, and now it's time to get into your main focal subject. So we're talking about relying on a teacher. So now what is analytical meditation that we do? How do we analyze? Analysis isn't glancing meditation. We aren't analyzing anything. If we're going the first category is this, second again, this leads to that. There's no analysis. It's just like a, a, a memorization coming out. Um, there isn't uh, the analysis there. So now we, we drive back to the first topic or the fourth topic, wherever we are at, whatever, wherever we need to start from realization perspective. Uh, and we tell our minds only to think about that topic. And we put it uh, almost like in the center of a room surrounded by people yelling at it, yelling questions at it, checking it and looking at it and wondering about it and looking under, you know, the hood, <laughs> looking above it, looking below it, looking at every single angle, it says in the Lam Rim, we possibly can at that topic. That's why we in the Lam Rim have chap, you know, this chapter goes on and on and on and on and on about the, you know, the six divisions, you know, you know, the definition, you know, of the teacher, and then it's, you know, so much points being made about that, and the definition of the student, and so, you know, so many points that are made about that, right? Um, you know, the benefits of, you know, let's, let's look at it directly. I, I have it memorized, but I'm, when I'm like just going sometimes, I wanna make sure we get it in the exact order. Uh, so we see like how we rely on the teacher. It's the root of the path. Why is the teacher the root of the path? We think about, you know, how we would learn the ABCs, et cetera, et cetera. And we start to look at 
okay, uh, how do we understand what a teacher even is? We define the teacher, uh, the defining characteristics of the teacher. Oh, Lord Maitreya says there's 10 of those. Uh, and what are those 10? Do I know what those 10 are? Uh, can I think about those 10? Um, and oh, wait, okay, so we start to think, do we know what those 10 qualifications of the teacher are? Uh, and we think about, oh, well, who, who is someone who maybe had those qualifications? And we think, oh, did Ken Sergeshe Wandak have those qualifications? And we start to think about, and we can relate those qualifications to an actual being and start to develop faith in an actual teacher that we're developing faith and reliance on, a real live being, or you know what I mean, right now he's alive in the uh, Dharmakaya or wherever else uh, Rinpoche is emanating, but real live in the sense that the omniscience uh, is everywhere. Uh, the Dharmakaya is, is everywhere. Um, uh, you know, so, you know, Rinpoche, you know, uh, was disciplined and we think about, uh, oh, the highest higher training in ethics and was serene, the highest higher training uh, in, in, in concentration and thoroughly pacify uh, the highest higher training in wisdom and so forth. We think about these qualities that an excellent teacher would have. We think about the teacher we're using as an object, for instance, our teacher, and we think about the qualities they have. We think about, we look at these 10 qualities and then we start to meditating on the qualities that our teacher has, right? Uh, and we look at it in every way possible. Uh, why should we rely upon the teacher? Then we say, how do we rely? How do we rely on thought? What's the attitude we should have? How do we train in faith? How do we remember the, the teacher's kindness? Why is the teacher kind? Why do we need to be respectful? And then we go, how to rely in, in practice. We look at all the practices related around guru devotion uh, and so forth. Then we look at the faults, uh, 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 the benefits of relying on the teacher and the faults of not relying on the teacher. And we have all of this information that we're kind of swinging around this pole, which is the topic, central topic, relying on the teacher, supporting information, all of those points. What's the definition of the teacher? Oh, there are teachers who have these qualities. Oh, the teacher is the source of all my good. Oh, the teacher, the Buddha said that in the future he would emanate as teachers. Oh, the Buddha doesn't need an, you know, uh, someone who is kind of like their spokesperson. The Buddha could just directly come. Uh, you know, how would the Buddha see uh, the most benefit? What would the Buddha see the most beneficial thing to do would be? Oh, it would be to teach sentient beings. The Buddhas don't wash away the sins with water. They don't remove suffering with their hands. They don't give you your realizations. They teach the Dharma. They teach the truth will remove your suffering. Uh, so when there's only so many beings in this huge world system doing that, we have to assume some of them are Buddhas. And this is where it gets sticky, I'm not a Buddha. Um, but what it says in the Lam Rim is, it was what the teacher actually is or isn't because you don't have omniscience, it becomes tough. Um, it kind of becomes none of your business. It becomes a thing you almost the shut off valve um, because you don't, you don't really, really know. Um, so you just kind of look at it as like a, a, a shut off valve. Um, and if you say, oh, I'm imagining as they are a Buddha. Um, and if I'm imagining that they're speaking uh, and it's a Buddha speaking, just think about the much more virtue that if you could, you know, uh, I, I'm not a Buddha, um, but if you could imagine that I was and you believe that, right? And you heard these words coming in, you know, in that kind of fashion, because the object of observation of Buddha is so much better than just regular old Jeff, the virtue becomes greater from the participant's side, even if it's imagined. Does that make sense? So even if it's imagined, there's a story of the dog tooth. Uh, someone's mother asked their son when they went on some pilgrimage and, uh, to bring a relic of the Buddha back. And the son gets back and realizes he forgot his mother, <laughs> forgot to bring a relic uh, and found a dog's tooth on the side of the road, polished it up, put it in a nice box and said, oh, mother, I've brought you uh, a tooth from Buddha. I brought you an actual relic of Lord Buddha. She was so happy uh, and just so filled with joy. And she put it on the altar um, and then day after day, just made prostrations and made offerings to this dog's tooth. And it said that it began to glow. 
uh, it began to become pure and virtuous uh, to, to, I don't know if everyone saw that or she's the only one who saw that or the Geshe saw that, I don't remember. But I think you understand, right? Um, it was the faith and the intention and the power of the object of observation that allowed for that extra special virtue to be created that transformed even her world. It transformed her entire world because of the amount of virtue created. And, and not by, you know, it, it, there's ignorance in there, but there's always ignorance in there. <laughs> We're the masters of, you know, stupid, you know, we don't like that word, but ignorant is, you know, a, Either where the truth's distorted. What does that sound like? <laughs> truth's really distorted, or I'm just don't know. I don't know. <sighs> one of the you can pick either one. You, you just this active state of not knowing, or just distorted. You know, um, you know. Uh, um, so you could pick your 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 way, uh, but that is the state that we we um, we sit in. Uh, so we aren't in a state of knowing. Uh, so the point of all of this, getting back and roping back in the, this chapter of the um, Lam Rim uh, is to be able to tell our minds what to do, to be able to meditate, to be able to put the topic in the center of the room and be able to you know, use all these reasons and use all of these quotes and all of these understandings uh, in order to support that central pole and make it so that it has a foundation uh, that's immovable. And that central pole is your mind, right? You're, you're making it, these topics immovable uh, in your mind uh, so that you know them, like you know the ABCs. I know that the teacher is the foundation of all my good qualities. Like, you, you know, I am talking right now and I'm not thinking about A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It's just so ingrained in me. I know how to put those sounds together and string them into a sentence and so forth. Um, that's all just going on behind the scenes, right? Um, and it starts to become second nature uh, that you would know this. Uh, and the more that you know this, the more it's stamped in your mind as we keep talking about. Now you've stamped something in your mind for your future lives that I need to meet with a guru. The foundation of all good qualities is a teacher. It's not all these other things that I was thinking they was before. And in so many few previous lives, I actually believed that the source of all my good was money, and that the source of all my good was fame, the source of all my good was praise, the source of all my good was getting a gift, hearing nice words. That was the source of all my good. People loving me and thinking I was the greatest thing in the world, because I think I'm the most important thing in the world, so everyone else better, you know? Um, thinking the source of all our good is ourself. A lot of lifetimes we thought that the source of all of our good was ourself. You know, and there's a lot of traditions that say, you don't need a teacher, just empty your mind. It's in you already, you'll figure it out. <laughs> no, 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 you need a teacher. The source of all my good is a teacher. So you're stamping in your mind. We've already had a stamp clearly because we met with the teacher. We met with the teacher because we had stamped in our mind to some degree that the source of all of our good was a teacher. So we met with one, but we didn't only, in my case, I didn't only meet with a teacher, right? I wasn't born and then I, in a monastery and I met with a lot of like wrong teachers and taught myself a lot of wrong things. So it obviously wasn't so natural that my mind was saturated with it in such a way that it would force me to just always have that. My mind had other things in it. We could prove it. I wasn't thinking that the source of all my good was my teacher. At some other points in time, I was chasing other things that I thought were the source of my good. Uh, and if you told me before I met Buddhism that the source of all my good uh, was someone who knew nothing about the world, uh, um, but knew about all these mystical things that they could tell you about, um, um, I would tell you that they don't know about the world. They don't know how life works, right? They're, they're out of it, right? You know, I'm gonna figure out through, you know, different things, psychedelics, or, you know, I'm gonna find some, some pathway uh, through something other um, than 
allowing myself to have the humility of saying, I don't know. And that's our, our problem a lot of times is we aren't able to say, I don't know, um, because of our ego. And uh, even with teachers, we hear a lot of these instructions on bodhicitta. And, you know, a lot of years, I wish someone would have raised their hand and said, but I don't really know how, how to actually sit down. I get the steps, I get the outline, but then how, what, how does this really, really like change my mind on a daily, like, well, how does this all work, right? Um, but we're afraid, you know, to say something like that um, or maybe don't even know to ask the question, but a lot of times we just don't want to say we don't know something. Um, it's our, our fear of, you know, even though we know we don't know everything, we have this weird thing where we think we're supposed to, so we're afraid to not to look like we don't. <laughs> it's the strangest thing because if we say to ourselves, Jenny Jeff, do you think you know everything? I'm like, I don't, I don't even know how electricity works, right? But then if I got in a room with a bunch of people who knew how electricity worked, right? I could be, you know, I don't know, maybe not in that topic, but uh, I could be prone to being uh, afraid to say like, I don't even know the basic principles around what you're all talking about, right? They invite me because they've heard like, oh, he's this Buddhist scholar, right? He like knows something about Buddhism. So they invite me to this like science thing because I was, Dalai Lama is really into science, right? <laughs> so I'm suddenly in this science thing. I don't know anything about physics. I don't know anything about science really. And, you know, they're discussing, you know, I don't even know how electricity works. They're discussing all these high things. My ego would feel funny about saying, I, I don't, I, don't, I, you know, they call on me and I would, my ego wouldn't, would have a hard time saying like, I just really, everything that you're saying is so foreign to me that it might as well be a, a different language. Cause I just don't, I don't know anything. You know, I may try to string together like a little proton electron sentence or something <laughs> when I have no idea, right? Just to like take the heat off. <laughs> Can you call on someone else just to take the heat off of my ego? And uh, a lot of times we just have to ask, right? Uh, um, and then we have to, 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 to look in, to say we don't know. Um, and that's what is part of this, putting that topic on that heavy foundation. It happens by us having that humility, saying I need a teacher. I don't know. And because I didn't always think that, it wasn't firm enough in my mind from my previous lives. I, I obviously didn't saturate it enough. So then I've got to worry, right? Am I going to meet a teacher in my next life? I know I say it. And I had this great relationship with Rinpoche. We're talking beginningless lives. I'm like a flip on the radar. And I obviously met with a teacher before because I met with a teacher. So am I so sure that I know that the foundation of all my good and all my lives until Buddhahood is the Lama. Am I so sure that I know that so much that I will meet a teacher in my next life beyond the shadow of a doubt? Do I have that so ingrained in my mind, like the ABCs, that I, I, I feel that it's so saturated that it couldn't possibly, at the end of my life, ignite anything but circumstances for a, a meeting with a teacher? Do we have that confidence? Do we know enough about what relying on a teacher is and what it isn't, right? Uh, we aren't putting, you know, they can't do the work for us. They tell us what to do, we do the work. We take the medicine that they give us. You know, the teacher is the doctor, the Dharma is the medicine. We gotta take the medicine. The practice is what actually allows us to evolve. Why are we doing that? Because we're sick, we're sick with afflictions. We're sick with, uh, the grasping at true establishment and the self-centered attitude that thinks we're the most important person in the world and no one else could be as important as us, ever. It could never, it could never be as important as we are. And like I said in the previous class, you, you, think, you don't think that you have that grasping, just wait till you're in a big room where you know, they call your name, right? You know, Jeff Allen, you're, I'm, that's me. <laughs> I'm Jeff Allen. And then they're saying, oh, we're giving away, uh, we've called three people's names. Uh, you know, one of you is the worst. One of you is the best, you know, and one of you just, you know, placed uh, in, you know, we're just keeping neutral. Jeff Allen that just got called now is like, oh, first I was like, oh, I just got called. I'm in a group, a group of individuals. Now it's like, well, 
there's a chance that Jeff Allen might be the worst, right? So you see just in that one example, how quickly we go to the self-cherishing. I hope someone else is worse. God, I hope I'm the best. Oh man, I hope it was Tim. They said, Tim, Jen and Jeff, God, I hope it's Tim that's the worst. I hope it's Jeff that's the best. Take neutral too, but don't make me the worst. Don't let me be embarrassed. Right? Very, very interesting when we, we uh, see how we act and we react. So we've got to find something super strong to combat that thing uh, that causes us to be so, you know, act so selfishly, to cause us so much pain uh, and causes others to suffer so much uh, because our mind is so broken that we, yeah, we act out physically and we storm out of places and we aren't considerate of others. Uh, it's just because of this ego grasping, the self-cherishing attitude that we need to get rid of. And the only thing that can get rid of that is understanding how to get rid of it. The only way we can understand how to get rid of it is by having a teacher. So we're just really learning all of that uh, in a very, uh, uh, a very clear way. Um, um, uh, so uh, uh, that's what we're analyzing. Uh, and um, I just wanna go back to the six preparations uh, just in case. Uh, so we first, we, um, because I think I left the sixth out, um, um, but let's just go through them again because we wanna be thorough. We wanna make sure we don't leave anything out. Uh, first, uh, we clean our room and put images of enlightenment, that's one. Uh, then uh, we uh, make offerings that we have, have obtained in the right way, you know, in an honest way, we put them out. Uh, then we get into the seven point Virakana posture with a clear mind. Then we imagine the merit field. Then we make a seven limb prayer offering. Uh, and then uh, a differing text, uh, they say make a mandala offering uh, uh, and then further supplications. Um, so. Uh, further supplications. May I, I, I think I did go over that. May I be able to be successful in this practice? May I be able to, um, and I, but I think I can tied it into the dedication section of the seven limb, um, but I wanted to make sure that I tied it properly also into the supplication section of the sixth preparation. So I apologize for not adding that in if I omitted that. Uh, I think that um, I might have. So uh, you're, you're making sure that you're focusing only on uh, this object of observation. So that's basically uh, uh, where I wanted to get to today, um, just to kind of talk about uh, what we're trying to do, um, um, just so that you can, you know, you determine it. So let's read the Lamrim Chemo. Therefore, from the beginning, uh, firmly determine the definite order and enumeration of whatever objects of observation uh, you wish to sustain. Then strengthen your will repeatedly thinking, I will not set up something that is different from what I have determined without exceeding or falling short of what you have determined, sustain your meditation with mindfulness and vigilance, right? Uh, so gain control of your mind. And there, you know, um, I think we'll read this whole section because uh, I think it's, it's good. Uh, that which is known as meditation is the act of sustaining an object of meditation and specific subjective aspects by repeatedly focusing your mind upon a virtuous object of meditation. The purpose of this is as follows. From beginningless time, you have been under the control of your mind. Your mind has uh, not been under your control. Furthermore, your mind tended to be obscured by the afflictions and so forth. Thus, meditation aims to bring uh, this to mind, which gives a rise to all faults and flaws under control, and then it aims to make it serviceable. Serviceability means that you can direct your mind as you wish towards a virtuous object. You might try to sustain your meditation by jumping to this and that object of meditation. You may consider setting up according to your wish a variety of virtuous objects of meditation in no specific order. Though you may do this, you will not be able to take up your object of meditation with this method. Consequently, you will greatly hinder your mind's ability to be directed as you wish toward a virtuous object of meditation. If you have made this a habit from the start, the virtuous practice of your whole lifetime will be flawed. Uh, so if you say, okay, I'm gonna sit down and meditate on renunciation, bodhicitta, and emptiness, and karma, and love, and compassion, I'm just gonna meditate on these topics and whatever comes to mind. Your mind is controlling your meditation. You're not in control. So Lama Tsongkhapa is saying, pick the order of your meditation and don't move, 
and, and follow it strictly um, and rein it back in when it isn't following that and be precise about the order uh, that you've set out from the start to do it in. And then it says also that you should do short sessions. And this is the last thing that I'm gonna say. Um, uh, as beginners, uh, we should do as many short sessions as possible um, because if we don't, we can have a lot more chance of being under control of laxity and excitement and not know it, especially laxity. We could just, you know, maybe get into a sleepy kind of zoned out state and just pass time. Uh, we shouldn't be looking at, well, how many minutes a day are you meditating? How many hours a day are you meditating? Well, that's not how our tradition says it. We would say, you know, Lama Tsongkhapa, I think says 18 small sessions. Uh, Geshe Dorji Damdu talks about one and a half minute meditation sessions uh, where we're analyzing things. We want to make sure that when we see our cushion the next time, that it isn't something we're dreading doing. That's, oh my gosh, it's, we want to still be in joy, still be happy, you know, when we get up from our meditation, you know, uh, not, you know, uh, something that's, you know, we've been fighting with uh, in order to try and sustain it because we've made some minutes goal or time goal that we're not reaching. Uh, we really have to take baby steps with this uh, and try to get to the point where we can rein our mind in for more and more period of time. Um, and this is where we speak more about it in calm abiding, these shorter sessions. Um, but analytical meditation, if your mind's flying all over the place, right, off the object, um, and you're just trying to sit there in it, um, maybe it's time to just, you know, get up and do something else um, uh, and so forth. So the, the object of observation of your meditation, uh, you know, um, after you make a dedication properly, uh, um, is then something you still work with. You still study it when you stand up from your cushion. You still try to use these points in, in seeing the Lama and everything, right? Um, so it's something that you apply in your daily life. Um, this meditation that we're gonna talk about more about uh, next week is what you apply on the meditation cushion, but then that object of analysis isn't something that you just leave until you get back to the meditation cushion. You then go back and learn more about it. You learn more things you can analyze about it with. You reread the Lam Rim about that topic. Uh, you, you know, you sit and while you're driving, you think about that topic. Um, and then you get back to your meditation cushion and you get very strict about how you do it. Um, so anyway, uh, that is my talk today about um, meditation. I wanted to get into a whole lot more. I had some other fancy topics and things to say. <laughs> Uh, but I apologize um, for not being able to be more skillful and compact them more. Um, so uh, hopefully in the future, I'll you know, be able to do so. Um, so anyway, uh, does anyone have any questions uh, before we do the prayers? Okay. Eight verses on training the mind by Geshe Langri Tamba. Okay, so now, same thing. We're making dedications, we're doing concluding prayers. What's going on? All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are in the space around us. So please, so happy we're doing this. Uh, you know, when, when a mother sees their child, I'm not a mother, I, I, you know, but uh, when a mother sees their child doing something good, right? Instead of something bad, uh, like even artwork, like <laughs> I've, I've witnessed this, like drawings, like from when it's, kids a child like oh you see how talented they were <laughs> not at all right but the mother sees like you know just 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 so happy with everything that the child does whenever they do anything even remotely <laughs> remotely good right and whether the buddhists and bodhisattvas want us to be doing stuff that's even remotely good and and, and only those things that could end our suffering forever and make us happy forever uh, and we're doing that. Uh, so all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are so happy uh, that we're doing that. And then all sentient beings are all around us and we're leading them uh, in these prayers uh, and we're leading them in these thoughts. We're helping them uh, understand in their minds these thoughts. Uh, and we are then connecting with all of these beings so that when we become a Buddha, uh, we can help them uh, on their path. And also, if they beat us to the punch, right? they can help us to become a Buddha. And that's why we have to understand we aren't the most important person in the world because it's you that might become a Buddha before me and you may be my only hope. 
you may be my only hope, my only savior, my only protector. Um, and that's the other way we relate to our friends, enemies, and neutrals, that each one of them could be our only hope and our only protector in the future. Um, so we have to see that the Buddha nature that all sentient beings have is something that's so precious uh, and that will eventually uh, give rise to Buddhahood. And we don't know the order, right? So each of these sentient beings that we're interacting with, though they may be acting out in a way at this very moment we don't like, they may have stores and stores and stores of, of merit just waiting to have the right causes and conditions to come to fruition. And they may in that same lifetime uh, that you saw them like that become a Buddha, right? Uh, it, can it can happen. Look at Milarepa through being misguided and doing black magic and you know, having his mother tell him to do terrible things uh, out of resentment, you know, killed people you know, through black magic and became a Buddha in that very lifetime. I'm sure the people's families uh, um, of the people, the families of the people that Milarepa killed didn't think Milarepa was really too fancy. Those people probably thought Milarepa was a demon devil, but Milarepa then in that same lifetime became their only savior. One of, right, became a reliable guide for them. That someone who would love them more than anyone ever could. So that also is what we think about when we think about uncertainty of who we're coming in contact with, uncertainty of future, uncertainty of what the past was. We have to think about all these things. So we assemble all these beings, the hell hungry ghosts, animal, humans, gods, and demigods all around us, all the, you know, their different forms and bodies. And we imagine that in their languages, uh, and we imagine that they have suffering to stop for long enough or too much happiness stop for just long enough to pay attention uh, to these prayers that we're doing. Um, so with that in mind, with all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and holy beings and Kensu Rinpoche in front of us and Geshe Lopes and Gompo and His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Geshe Doji Damdu and Geshe Aga uh, and, and all of the holy, holy beings who have affected us are, and will affect us, all the Buddhas of the three times we imagine the space in front of us and all sentient beings around us. Uh, and we say this prayer, have this intention and dedicate it uh, to becoming a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. The eight verses on training the mind by Geshe Langritambo, with the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all, respectively hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind. And as soon as disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings as if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer victory to them. When the one whom I benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone uh, without exception, all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all the harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns as by understanding all phenomena as like illusions uh, be released from the bondage of attachment. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure land. I dedicate whatever virtues I've collected for the benefit of the teachings of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozan Drapa to shine forever. I send forth this jewel mandala to you, precious guru. I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised as supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness, all powerful Avalokiteshvara, Tenzin Yatso, may you stay until some sars end. I pray that we may in all of our lives never be separated from Ken Sergeshe Wandak in whatever form he or she chooses to show us. May we meet with him or her while they emanate in our world. And may we in the future meet with him or her in the enjoyment body when we are Arya Bodhisattvas and be able to quickly achieve Buddhahood. And until we reach that final, final stage of Buddhahood, may we never, ever, ever be separated from our lamas, in particular, Kensu Geshe Wanda. And may we then become 
uh, his companion or her companion in the quest to save all sentient beings from suffering when we become Buddhas because of relying upon him. So thank you everybody so much. And I wanna also say happy birthday uh, to Lobson Dunya. Uh, Lobson was a very long time student of Ken Sergeshe Wandok it, and uh, is currently in Sarah J Monastery studying to get his Geshe degree. He's very, very bright in the Prajnaparamita class. Um, and he's doing well and he's debating uh, um, right in there uh, as, you all know in Tibetan language uh, with the Tibetan, you know, native tongue speakers uh, and um, placing uh, when they have the examinations, um, there's top of class folks, you know, there's like a certain number, 16, I don't know the number, but he's placing in those num in those. Um, so we want to say I rejoice, love some la and all of the good that you're doing. I rejoice in what you're doing with debate school at Sarah J. And I want to say a big, big happy birthday to you. Uh, and maybe your mom can pass that along. Maybe we can cut this and maybe even send this to you. Um, uh, but I just want to say thank you. Your friendship means a lot to me. Uh, your knowledge means a lot to me. And I know that anytime I need to ask you a question, you're right there on WhatsApp and you won't give me the small answer because you know I don't want the small answer. Yeah. And I appreciate that so much about you and I appreciate your mind. So happy birthday. I won't <laughs> sing, uh, but you know, happy mm -hmm. birthday to you. And then the other one that's more fun. It's like happy birthday. Just imagine we were all doing all these <laughs> versions of happy birthday <laughs> to you. <laughs> I like the second one a lot. I find that one is usually the joyful one. The fun folks use that one in my experience in life. They, they do the regular happy birthday and then they really, they get down with the second happy birthday. So I send you both happy birthdays and a joyous uh, happy birthday to you. All right. So thank you. Thank you, um, thank you Jeff. I'll pass this on, on to him. Yeah, you tell, you tell him. Generous my wishes. To Lo Sun. And I know he greatly, you know, respects and appreciates your friendship. Thank you. Thank you so much. Tell him I got silly for him. And, and just as was uh, announced, that's Stevie Wonder. Um, I don't know if that's true, but I saw it in the chat. So I'll take it as true because it's a, <laughs> someone who knows their music. Anyway, thank you. Smile. Be better people, right? If you're smiling, right? The Dalai Lama always says the first thing he learned is that if you smile, then other people smile and they seem to feel happy. And you're generating virtue just by doing that simple physical motion because we generate virtue by making other people happy. So if we could smile a little more, we could be a little kinder, be a little gentler, try to put these teachings into our life and see that you know everyone we come in contact with uh, is our mother and understand that this pen that I don't have in my hand, but imagine I had a pen in my hand that's made out of plastic that, you know, had to come from petroleum that, you know, has ink in it and it has all these different parts. Geshe Dorje Damdu said, uh, could never ever be afforded if one being, if there was never a pen on the earth and one being said, I want to give all my riches to have, you know, a pen made. I'm going to pay for all of its production, the mining and the, all of the factories and make this one pen. One person couldn't afford it, but through the kindness and dependent origination of others, we're able to have things like pens. So those people aren't so stranger to us. We are connected to them. We're connected to all of the components and beings, the previous beings that uh, were around uh, and, and uh, through dependent origination allow us to have a comfortable lifestyle uh, and have the things that we have. So look at beings when you see them as so kind uh, and know that it's in dependence upon other beings that we have all of the wonderful things that we have uh, and, and realize that um, just because we don't know who they are um, uh, doesn't mean that we can't build a huge mind uh, because of the kindness they've shown us in our previous lives that would love them more than anyone ever could. So that's our goal. Let's try to do as good as we can at that, but be realistic. Know ourselves and be realistic. This is baby steps. Since beginningless time, we've been ignorant. So it's gonna take a little while. Thank you.